You are not going to grow by studying the Bible. You are not going to grow by studying the Word. You are going to grow. Hello, and a very, very warm welcome back word. to the teaching series, The Jesus That John Knew. Well, we heard last time Jesus' call to the disciples to rise, let's go from here. And that was the call to move over, I think, into a much higher, much more uh, mystical, if you will, much more mysterious walk with God. And it's that that we want to pursue as we, as we move into John chapter 15. And in John 15, we're going to see this seminal uh, illustration of the vine and the vine dresser. Uh, and of course, the, the cast is set that Jesus is the vine, not only the vine, the true vine, as he describes himself, that the Father is the vine dresser, and that you and I are the, the branches. Uh, and Norman Grubb talked about this in, in, in many, many times, and one of the, the things I remember him saying very well was this idea of saying that through giving us this illustration of the vine and the branches, our eyes are open, Norman said, to the secret of the universe. Now, that's a big statement. And the secret of the universe, according to Norman Grubb, was union. The mystery of the universe, he used to say, was that how can two be one, but yet remain two? <laughs> so this idea that the, that, the, that the living God, the living Christ and I, you and I, actually become one person, function as one person, from, from which separation is now an utter impossibility because it just totally disappeared. We function entirely, forever, and naturally as one person, yet remain two. That is the mystery of the gospel. And that's why Jesus says, come on, let's come up, let's arise and go from here. The book of Revelation says, come, come up higher. And, and I, at this stage of which my spiritual development has, has reached, and I don't say that as if it's any kind of pinnacle, it just literally I mean that my level of, of understanding now is, 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 is merely that, that says we function entirely as one. There is no separation between me and God and you and I, and yet we're one, but we're two. And that's a profound mystery. Uh, the, the, the Bar Mitzvah boy's declaration, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The declaration of the young man in Christ, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God and I are one, yet we remain two. What <laughs> a very interesting concept. And that's what we're after. So, so let's, let's just jump into this for a moment, see, see what we can see. Uh, and it, it, I don't think there's a particularly uh, systematic way to talk about these things. I think it's just nice just to walk and talk and just engage as we think through together. But let's, let's introduce the cast then. The true vine, the vine dresser, and the branch. And we're going to explore this together over the next some weeks and see, see where it takes us. Um, but the... The, the question that I'm immediately drawn to is when I read in the text here that what Jesus is saying is he's saying, now look, I am the true vine, yes. My father is the vine dresser, yes. Every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Uh, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So now, uh, immediately I'm my hackles are up and my kind of religious antennae switches itself on because I read a little verse here that says every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit then he takes that away uh, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes and further on I'm going to read about you know throwing into the fire and so on and so the, immediately my uh, religious history will begin to stir in me some kind of apocalyptic thought that something's going to go bad with me. Um, but watch, there are two concepts, two streams through which the, the branches flow. The fruitful and the fruitless. The fruitful are cut off, the fruitless are cut back. The, fr the fruitful are cut back and the fruitless are cut off. Now, the, the fruit less are cut off and become of some use, 
the fruit full are cut back and become of more use. Nothing is useless in God. That's important to understand. That. Nothing is, in, is useless in God. Now, wh why is it that, that, that it's necessary to prune? Let me tell you something. Um, when you're growing and you seem to be flowing and moving in the things of God, um, what is that about when, when the pruning shears of, 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 of grace, and they are grace shears, when they come and begin to prune you and cut you back, and you're thinking, I, I don't get that. I mean, the full bloom and the full flow of what you're doing, why am I being cut back? Well, you know, in the natural realm, in, in the realm of horticulture, and believe me, I don't know too much about this, so, uh, so forgive me if, if you know more and I'm putting this it, 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 uh, clumsily, but you prune for a number of reasons. One of the reasons that you might prune for is that you need to, to, to keep the, the, the bush or the plant or the tree or whatever it might be, you need, you, sometimes you need to help keep it um, healthy and to help it stay in shape. Uh, if you see sometimes when you get this wild spurts of growth and, and there's a kind of there's a symmetry in God, there's a beauty in God, and sometimes there's just a need just to, to reshape that. Um, in my book, The Bonsai Conspiracy, I talk about how um, the, 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 we, we've been miniaturized through this process of selective pruning, that every time our kind of uh, arms stretch out in wonder, then someone comes along and shoots you and says, you should do this, you shouldn't do that, and shrinks you back into this and makes you this little bonsai. But pruning is a different proposition because pruning promotes growth in this sense, and that's important. Um, they're often a dead branches or broken branches. They just need to be removed because when you remove the dead branches and the broken branches, what that does is that then allows the plant to continue its lively growth. And they, friends, there there are things in our lives that need to be cut off. There's no question about that. We don't need to get religious or down or you know beat up on ourselves about it. It just is what it is. That sometimes we you know we have dead dead branches and and, and kind of broken bits on us. That's all right. Um, and that, that cutting away has the, um, the positive effect of promoting new growth. Um, sometimes you might, you might prune because the, 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 the foliage has got just too dense uh, and you need to thin it out a little bit in order so that the air and the light can kind of reach into the interior of the branches. Uh, and that's a really important point because sometimes right in the depth of the branch there can just be darkness and that light and the air needs to come in and to breathe life into those things as well. Um, so the idea definitely with this pruning business is it's designed to encourage root growth. That's the point. And then the point is it, it's, it enables the tree or the branch or the, or the bush or whatever it might be to continue growing healthily and healthy growth is enhanced by pruning. In the same way, spiritual growth, spiritual development is absolutely promoted and enhanced by cutting back. That's the way it works. Some diseased or neglected plants need to be pruned because you want to rejuvenate growth. Uh, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a real sense in which this metaphor really stands up. And so remember, the important thing is that the Father is the vine dresser, which means that the Father is the one that walks in the garden in the cool of your day, looking at the, the branch, looking at the growth and the healthy growth of the branches. And sometimes I'll just come and just cut something away. Sometimes I'll just come and cut something back. And what you thought was a flower is actually a weed. And I'll just come and cut it back and untangle this and remove that and just clear house a little bit for you. Don't mind that. Don't resist that. I know it's a horrible looking thing when the beautiful, lively plant's been cut back and now it's naked. But there's part of the mystery of grace that you can learn to be naked and not ashamed. That's part of the mystery of it. Now Paul, you know, for his part, he sees this metaphor and he thinks it's a powerful one. He actually takes it a little bit further. If I may say, he builds on the metaphor in Romans chapter 11. And in Romans 11, he introduces a concept to us called uh, grafting. And this grafting concept, I want to kind of bring in here to talk to us about this so we can understand the abiding principle. But let's just build it up for a minute. Abide in me. <coughs> Jesus is saying, abide in me. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. My goodness, what a simple message this is for the church. We cannot bear fruit by ourselves. That's it. You don't produce fruit, you produce works. 
you bear fruit. And the fruit that you bear is a result of the root. The branches are supported by the root. The fruit is the outworking, the expulsion, if you will, of the life inside of it. And the life inside of it is the root, the sap, and that sap is God. Uh, that, the, the, the clearest evidence of that we have in Scripture, where we hear about this whole nature of the olive tree and the support, the, the root is that which brings the life from the olive tree. Uh, I am the vine. Let's be clear, Jesus says. You're not the vine. You're the branches. I'm the vine. Uh, and you're the branches. Whoever abides in me, and we'll talk about that in one second, and I in them, this mutuality. Now, th that's important because um, this mu mutuality of abiding is very important because it's saying, if you abide in me and I abide in you, and that lifts us into a different space because we're now talking about this sort of, this knowing of one another. We're now talking about the difference between being in love uh, and being in love just requires a mere kind of casual acquaintance, if you like. But being loving requires a life that's observed, a person that is known, a depth of intimacy. And, and, and Jesus is saying, if you abide in me, you, you, you're, you're going to bear much fruit. In fact, apart from me, you can't do anything. Now, I know that because of the way that we've been taught our Christianity and we've been given a religious brand instead of a spiritual brand, I know some of us think that because of him we can do nothing. But no, it's not that. It's apart from him we can do nothing. And that's a very, very beautiful little point. That apart from him we can do nothing. In the delightful little book, which I highly recommend to you by Andrew Murray, called Abiding Christ, Andrew Murray demonstrates how for him, this, this invitation to come to him. Uh, you remember the verse in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. The anticipation is that having come, that you would, you would abide. Uh, so his idea of, of that is not that you would, you would come and rest a while, not that you would take respite, but that you would take residence. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you take residence in me, and I am resident in you, we are abiding in one another. And the, 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 the fruit of your life will be from the root that is me, that is Christ. And it's like Andrew Murray is saying, don't come to me for a rest. Don't, don't come to me for a holiday, if you like. Emigrate to God. Move out. Pack your bag. Just move there, you know. Uh, and, and it's really an important way to understand the message because you don't rest and then get refreshed as you do with a holiday and then come back and do it all over again. No, 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 no. You don't rest from work. You work from rest. It's not a question of recharging your spiritual batteries. It's about rechanging and renewing your spiritual mind. Um, but how do you become fixed in this abiding then? How does that work? Well, Paul seems to think that the way that happens is through this process that we call grafting. Paul's actually the only person that uses this metaphor. He uses it in Romans 11, and it's very powerful. Um, and I think that both Jesus's and Paul's metaphors, or allegories, if you will, sit very comfortably together because they're both suggesting something most important. They're both suggesting there's more than one vine, and I think that's very helpful. And, and if we rely upon what we've read uh, Noah from the Garden of Eden, then we know in fact that there were at least two trees that are in question. There's many trees in the garden, but two specific trees that were of relevance to us. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of course, and the tree of life. And we know that man fell as a result of eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. We know that. He ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and contrary to the sanction of the Lord. And, and in so doing so, he, he died spiritually. Important. So the serpent's appeal to Eve is interesting, because what the serpent says to Eve is, uh, look, God doesn't want you to taste of this fruit, because he knows that on the day you taste thereof, your eyes will be opened. Now, it was true, wasn't it? that when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of evil, their eyes were opened. But what the devil didn't say was that their eyes, that what, what they did was whilst they gained their sight, they lost their 
insight. Man's eyes were open to the natural, I mean, sorry, he was naked, but they were closed to the spiritual realm. They were closed to the spiritual realm of guilt-free God consciousness and open to the realm of sin and self-consciousness and guilt consciousness. And now they become conscious of good and evil. They are now in the realm of us and them. They were now in the realm of good and bad, in and out, lost and saved black and white, male and female. Uh, they were in the realm of, 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 of duality, of, of, of double-mindedness, of, of double vision, of, uh, well, they were a door of separation, I guess. Um, and with this um, new dubious enlightenment came this new sense of this, and this kind of unwelcome vocabulary to describe these terrifying feelings they, they hadn't experienced before. And it's almost as though the kind of four horsemen of the apocalypse rushed upon them. Fear, shame, blame, despair, all came tumbling, crashing down on top of them. And suddenly we, we find ourselves listening to this, to, to, to Moses retelling the story. And, and, and booming through history is this idea that I was naked and, and, and now I have this sense of shame. And, and Adam would, would recruit any mechanism he could in order to deal with that. So before the fall, we had them self-aware, aware of and intimate with God. Before the fall, we had them having dominion, naked and not ashamed. But after the fall, we have them now self-conscious. We have them unaware of God. We have them being dominated and we have them covering up. Now, it's, it's, it's important because man now spiritually dead, if you will, is left to fumble in the dark with only this, the, the sense realm to now inform and guide his decision making. And until or un unless he comes to recognize his true self, he'll remain being, if you like, uh, of the soul rather than being what he's made to be, or, or, of the spirit. How interesting that when Jesus comes, the very first thing he says as he begins his public ministry is, behold, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to do what? To preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. How wonderful. Uh, and Paul says when he's in the court of King Agrippa, he says, God is sending me to open the eyes of the Gentiles so they may turn away from darkness and turn to light. Now, here's the thing for you to grab, and it's an important grab. The consequence of the fall, big point, was much more far-reaching than Adam uh, being cut off. The more far-reaching point that was that he wasn't just cut off, he was grafted on. So through his disobedience, Adam grafted himself on to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and thus he assumes its nature. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, you are by nature children of wrath, and begins to bear its fruit. Romans chapter 7 verse 5, the fruit unto death. Now this is, this is, this is the new dilemma. And so here is man, here is all man, all humanity, using, the, using this metaphor, uh, now grafted on to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil drawing from its root and bearing its fruit. So in this paradigm then, the, the salvation piece is about the process of being cut off from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and grafted on to the tree of life. And this, I think, is what lies at the heart of John chapter 15. This abiding which gives us the capacity to reproduce Jesus. So, let me pause there, let me, let me pause it there for this week and, and, and I'll come back next week to talk to you about what grafting is because I think this is worth just taking a little bit of time just to work this out with you. Um, hope it's helping. I'm going to take time because I think this is such a key, key subject. Have a fantastic week. I'm looking forward to being with you again. God bless you. Bye-bye now.
us really believe God? How many of us truly believe God? Or how many of us in our darker moments, in our moments are where, where the of, of credit crunch, in our moments where life seems to crowd in on us, where our circumstances seem to overwhelm us, instead of believing God, put our trust in ourselves. You see, because the real nature of this thing, this, what this whole thing is really going to be about when we come right down to the wire is, I know you believe in God, but do you believe God? Do you believe that God will do what he said he'll do? Because if you believe, you will wait. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength.